Okay, I think we're all set. Andrew, uh, go ahead and share your screen. We should be able to start. All right. Does that, uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Well, Joni can at least. That's all that matters, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joni. Uh, thank you very much, Tina. Um, and let's see, hopefully that button works correctly. Does that, does that look great, Looks Joni? Good. Yep. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for your, uh, what day is today? Wednesday? Your Wednesday evening. Um, uh, it's, a, it's awesome to be invited to the Buena Vista Audubon Society uh, meeting. I work for uh, another chapter of the, the National Audubon Society, the San Diego chapter, but we did just last month uh, change our name to a, a bird alliance. Um, but I've been in, in Michi I've been in uh, San Diego County for only about six years. I'm from New York, um, but I met my wife out here. We lived on the East Coast for a while and, and we moved back uh, to be closer to her family about six years ago. So I'm pretty new here. Uh, but in the time that I've been here, as Joni mentioned, um, we we're doing a lot of conservation work um, and the Three Wild Mission Bay project is a big piece of the time that I spend working for the San Diego Bird Alliance. And I'm happy to, to tell you more about it. And I'm happy to answer questions and whatnot as we go along. I don't know how interactive it usually is, but I, I've got hours and hours of stuff that we could talk about. But I'll, I'm planning for 40 minutes or so and then um, question and answer. And I can, I can stay for the whole hour if you want, or I can pack it up early if there's no questions. But feel free to... Raise your hand, I guess, if that helps, and, and we can make this a little bit more interactive if there's something that's not clear or questions that you have about what, what it is that we, um, what I'm sharing. I'm happy to do it that way, or we can save questions to the end, whatever works for you all. Um, but So thank you very much to Tina for that, um, that introduction about the unceded territory that we are all uh, sitting on, standing on, living in. Um, uh, I don't, um, just to add to what Tina mentioned, um, Amy Admire from the Payam um band has emphasized to me, uh, which is in line with what Tina mentioned, but that the that her people would come down to Mission Bay often. And, and Tina mentioned that it was a, wasn't a straight line, obviously, on the ground. And it was um, people traveled all over the place into each other's territories for whatever reason. So she's emphasized in our, my conversations with her about this project that it also, it was Kumeyaay territory for sure, but that it was also a valuable asset to the Payam uh, Kuwicham. So hopefully um, the project um, uh, is also, is gonna be beneficial to all kinds of Native American groups as well as our other coalition members. Uh, but that's very, very cool. Thank you, Tina, for, uh, for sharing that at the beginning. Okay, so here we go. So the Rewild Mission Bay project is a, um, a project of the San Diego Bird Alliance. Um, it's one that we got active in over 10 years ago. We started with the feasibility study. And since then, since 2018, when that feasibility study is done, it's become an advocacy project. And really skipping to the end here in May of 2024, just a couple of months ago, our city council voted on um, a version of this, which we, we are somewhat somewhat pleased with. Um, but now it's kind of moved on to this phase where we're still got a couple of things that we're advocating for, but we also are happily moving into hopefully getting the work actually done. So that's kind of the arc of the story here um, from our point of view. I used to give these talks, I've given these talks for several years at which it was an advocacy project and we were able to yell at the city well, we're still able to yell at the city, but now um, the city has acted on something and that'll be a, a different kind of ending than, than normally I give to these talks. So, so we'll get there over the course of uh, the next 40 minutes or so. So has anybody, has everybody been to Mission Bay? Has anybody um, uh, not been to Mission Bay, I guess? Hopefully you have, that'll give this some good geographic context. And, and um, I bet you've been bird watching there. It's full of, it's full of thousands of birds for sure. Um, I'll emphasize some of them today, but hopefully some of the pictures and some of the um, ecological history here rings true. I know it's a um, similar stories in tidal wetlands, including Buena Vista Lagoon, one way or another, um, all up and down the coast, including including your lagoon. So our our lagoon, our estuary uh, that we spend that the Rewild Mission Bay project is focused on is obviously now what we call Mission Bay. 
Um, but it didn't hasn't looked like this, like what we know of it uh, now for for very long, really, in the history of human habitation around here. Um, it certainly looked like this my whole time here. Like I said, I've only been here for for a few years. It's looked like this for generations. And so a lot of people come to these meetings and come to this issue saying, my grandparents and my great grandparents and I want to bring my kids, yada, yada. But that idea that human history, the past couple of generations and the next couple of generations is really not that long, um, especially when we think about the Kumeyaay connection to this space. So all of these kind of big, big earth moving changes, very awesome, very uh, uh, astounding changes that have happened in Mission Bay and again, lots of other places are really just about 75 years old. Um, a lot of the uh, the uh, city of San Diego was messing around with the San Diego River for over 100 years since the 1850s or 60s, trying to get it to go the direction they wanted it to, but not very successfully. Uh, a lot of this earth moving didn't work so well and was messed up by flooding and, and high flows and storms and those kinds of things until we really got um, active in Mission Bay in the 40s. We started planning for it and, and 40s and 50s, we started moving around a lot of earth in Mission Bay. So the photo all the way on the left here gives you an idea of what Crown Point and the causeway heading south from Crown Point used to look like. Pacific Beach and Mission Beach on the left-hand side of that photo, and then Ocean Beach is at the very bottom of it. But you can see most of Mission Bay in this hodgepodge of, of air photos is a huge delta for the San Diego River, a lot of uh, mudflat habitat. And then at the very top on the right-hand side is uh, a big tidal wetland complex and mudflat complex for Rose Creek, what we now call Rose Creek. And as you go along these photos, it's really very cool and very uh, sad, um, depending on your context, to see all of these islands blink into existence and see all of that habitat <clears throat> taken away and drastically changed. So that in 2021, when this air photo was taken, um, this is the bay that certainly I know as being kind of normal. But really 75 years is not that long of a time and especially when we're talking about habitat restoration and also when we're talking about human reconnection we have to have a much longer longer point of view than just the last 75 years for for us the california least tern native plants that rely on ocean dune ecosystems like the nuttles lotus down here in the middle photo and then ridgeways rails which are the hardest bird to say in my opinion I hope um, I get all those R's in there every time I say it, but I probably won't. Uh, those birds and those plants and a lot of other wildlife um, lost a whole lot of habitat, lost a whole lot of ecological function, lost a whole lot of opportunity um, as we change the bay drastically from left to right here. This is a really useful map. It's made by the Spanish, um, so it's not a not a Kumeyaay map, but it certainly reflects what the bay looked like before all of the earth moving happened in the, the mid 1900s. Uh, so False Bay is what the Spanish called it uh, down here in, in Mission Bay. But you can see Pacific Beach and Mission Beach on the left hand side again. You can see Crown Point there and you can see that Mission Bay used to be a huge tidal wetland, mudflat, and a little bit of open water uh, habitat complex. <clears throat> and right now the airport and SeaWorld and Old Town and uh, Midway District are all down here um, connecting through upland habitat uh, out to Point Loma. So Point Loma obviously existed and where Ocean Beach existed down here going south. But a lot of this space between Mission, Mission Bay and San Diego Bay was low lying, it was uh, wetland, it was where the San Diego River would go and wind its way sometimes into Mission Bay, sometimes into San Diego Bay. <clears throat> so, and this is an important context for the Native American connection and lost connection to this space. If we want to look at and think about how humans can live alongside a much more thriving habitat, a habitat that has a lot more space for all of those species that need tidal wetlands, coastal tidal wetlands. We don't have to look very far. We don't have to look to other places. We have thousands and thousand year history of humans living alongside what we now call Mission Bay. Uh, the Kumeyaay have lived along the banks of, of Mission Bay since time immemorial. And so they tell us, they show us that it's totally possible to live in better harmony and with with uh, tidal wetland and restore some of those habitats and restore some of that lost connection that humans used to have to this space. <clears throat>
So the Rewild Mission Bay project started in 2020, in 2014. My predecessor, Rebecca, and our previous executive director, a lot of those folks um, have moved on in 10 years uh, working for us, 11 years now. Um, the, they had the great idea, the really good sense to look at the Mission Bay Park master plan and say, the master plan calls for wetland restoration in the northeast corner of Mission Bay. Let's help the city get there. Uh, otherwise, or you could <clears throat> see that as let's give the city what the, it needs to actually act on this good idea. So with grants from the Coastal Conservancy and the Fish and Wildlife Service, we created the Wetlands Restoration Feasibility Study to kick off and set a science-based understanding of what used to be there, what we were talking about when we were talking about restoration, and what the options were for getting back, back to some of that habitat in the northeast corner of Mission Bay. <clears throat> Long story short, there's a lot of information in that feasibility study, but this is the study area. Again, hopefully this looks pretty familiar. It's the northeast corner of Mission Bay. It currently has Kendall Frost Marsh Reserve, which is a UC San Diego natural reserve system, and the, and the Northern Wildlife Preserve, which is city of San Diego property. On the left, it includes space leased by a company called Campland in the center there, and it includes the De Anza Boot and the De Anza Cove area um, which uh, are on the east side of Rose Creek. So now that the San Diego River doesn't flow into Mission Bay, Rose Creek is the largest source of fresh water coming into to, uh, Mission Bay. And this is the plan that our uh, title wetland, um, our feasibility study said was one of the feasible alternatives. There were three different alternatives, as you can see at the top, that made it through. And this is the one that our board and our staff and now all of the coalition members that we've been um, organizing and, and uh, energizing to make a reality. This is the one that we are trying to get the city or we're trying to get the city to uh, adopt. This tidal wetland restoration is not a full on tidal uh, wetland restoration plan. It's as you can see, it's pretty blobby still. It doesn't include topography. Uh, so it's about a 30% design that came out of our feasibility study. But with this information, the brown is mud flat, the greens are, are tidal marsh, and the yellow and red are increasingly taller upland, transitional and upland habitat that the marsh moves into as, tie, as, as sea levels rise. This is the basis. We know about how much it would cost. We know what sea level rise will do to it. We know what high flows from the river and storm surge from the, from the bay would do to this space. So we have a baseline understanding of this, how this would function, and that's enough for us to advocate to the city that tidal wetlands are valuable for a whole bunch of different reasons, and this is how the city should lead and use our public park so that it um, is doing all, is restoring this habitat um, and also being an economic benefit to the city. So. We built a coalition. Uh, we we looked around, and aside from uh, San Diego Audubon and uh, Buena Vista Audubon, we couldn't find any other bird nerds that wanted to sign on to this just because of the bird habitat. So we expanded our coalition uh, building way beyond, or not way beyond, but beyond just uh, bird-focused groups. For us, we certainly got started in this project because of Ridgeways Rails and California Lee Sterns and the other species that use the bay. But uh, we got those, those uh, support from those groups, it was you, you guys and us, very quickly. And then we're like, well, this isn't enough power to really push the city towards habitat restoration. And uh, for all these reasons that we want, we have to start talking about other reasons why this kind of habitat restoration is valuable. One of the obvious ones is about water quality. Uh, tidal wetlands filter water as they go through it. If it's uh, fresh water flowing into the bay, if it flows through a tidal wetland, it improves its water quality. And then twice a day, the tides flowing in and out of, of this kind of habitat are also improved as they move into the tidal wetland and then out of the tidal wetland. And no surprise, you guys are, are a little farther north than all of the water quality problems that, that San Diego County has, or most of the water quality, uh, the seawater uh, water quality problems that the county has. But aside from Imperial Beach and those places affected by the Tijuana border uh, sewage crisis that is still going on, this area of Mission Bay is the second worst place in the county for water quality. The county uh, looks at water quality and so does this really useful um, uh, volunteer run program called the Blue Water Task Force. It's run by uh, Surfrider, 
Coast Keeper also has started doing and has done some um, water quality monitoring in Mission Bay in the past. <clears throat> Volunteers collect this information at this to the same standard that the uh, county collects, but more often and in a nice format here that you can really see very easily. Looking at the camp land location right at the mouth of Rose Creek, this site, this part of, of Mission Bay needs improved water quality. Uh, this one is from the end of or from mid 2023, 58% of the time the water quality uh, collected here passed the water quality standards, which means that 42% of the time you were not supposed to get into the water, it was bad for your health. And I just got this. Uh, so, so that's what it looks like. If you ever use look at this website, it's pretty useful, pretty, pretty user friendly. I just got this one from yesterday or a couple of days ago. So as of the end of August, um, or one or two weeks into September, it now is 62% of the time it meets water quality standards, which means that almost 40% of the time you're, it's unsafe for contact in this corner of the bay. So there's no question that we need better water quality. We are attracting people to Mission Bay. It's a water, it's the world's largest water uh, aquatic park, uh, but we're attracting people to this corner of the bay through at a public beach and at boat launches and paddle boarding and canoeing and all those kinds of things, jet skiing to water that is unsafe 40% of the time. So we need a tidal wetland habitat here to improve water quality for everybody that uses the bay. Another thing that we that got gets a lot of people thinking about restoring and reconnecting to the northeast corner of the bay is that compared to Mission Bay, there's a lot of very privatized access to this to the shoreline here. The shoreline in Mission Bay should be and is public property, but Camp Land and the De Anza areas were, were uh, outlined and created so many decades ago that there is no public path that runs around these places. Uh, it's hard to access these spots. The parking um, is unclear. And in fact, the companies that run these places have gotten in trouble to the tune of millions of dollars of fines for blocking public access. It really seems like this is a place that's specifically for the users of these two places, uh, but it's not, it shouldn't be. And we can get a better designed public access to this space, just like the rest of Mission Bay has. Even the hotels and SeaWorld around Mission Bay, there's public access to the coast in those areas. And we can get a better uh, layout of public access in this Northeast corner as we're deciding what land use should look like here. But not only is it important just for everybody who uses Mission Bay, it's also an opportunity to reconnect the Kumeyaay people to this space that they have been kicked out of and have had a really hard time accessing for hundreds of years. So these are photos from a Thule boat launch. Thule boat is a, um, a watercraft that, that Kumeyaay use and have used uh, for a long, long time made out of reeds. In 2022, there were 22 boats made and launched as part of the Love Your Wetlands Day air, uh, activity in, the, in Mission Bay. And those 22 boats were the most Thule boats launched in Mission Bay for over 100 years. So that access between this kind of uh, culturally important use and this kind of celebration and this kind of uh, fishing and, and um, celebration in the area has been severed because it's so hard to access anything like what that habitat used to be and uh, anything where the, these kinds of species used to live. So in the Northeast corner of the Bay, we really have an opportunity, the city has an opportunity, and we would say uh, a responsibility to recreate and restore the human connection opportunities for Kumeyaay people, as well as all San Diegans. <clears throat> and then another, the other big argument that we've been making for why tidal wetland habitat and, and accessible tidal wetland habitat is the way to go is that we all know sea level rise is going to drastically change our shoreline unless we get ready for it. I'm sure it's something that's in the minds of the Buena Vista Audubon Society. I know uh, Natalie and, and some of the other folks working on the Lagoon Restoration Project up there have been thinking about it and planning for it. We, the city of San Diego was forced to start thinking about this. Our Rewild Mission Bay project and its sea level rise modeling was the first actual land use plan, an actual model of sea, what sea level rise would do in any of the Mission Bay Park. And that got the conversation started to say that, to, so that we could go to the city and say, hey, we should be planning for sea level rise. You should be planning for sea level rise. And if you're not, it's a waste of time and a waste of uh, investment in a public park that's not going to be resilient to sea level rise. A couple of years after we did it, the city was forced to, from the state, anybody who manages tidal, uh, state tidal wetlands, 
had to start thinking about sea level rise. So this is the city's own model for sea level rise impacts in Mission Bay. And long story short, the northeast corner there where you can see De Anza Peninsula pretty, uh, pretty obviously is going to be impacted uh, at 0 0.25, 0 0.5, certainly one meter of sea level rise, which is in the coming decades before 2100, as the uh, models are saying uh, at the moment. So we know that the city should be planning for sea level rise here and should be designing a park that's ready to be flooded. <clears throat> Along those lines, we also started working with researchers from uh, from Scripps and UC San Diego in Kendall Frost Marsh, which is Marsh, which is uh, UC San Diego property. Uh, now it's managed for research and for uh, to be a community asset for outreach and education. So partnering with uh, this researcher here, Matt Costa, we helped get a lot of soil core samples from the marsh. And sometimes uh, it was wet and sometimes it was just muddy uh, when we were taking those ones. But he led a, a research project to take soil core samples, samples throughout the marsh so that we could better understand how much carbon was sequestered per year and how much carbon was stored in the soil to talk about this kind of habitat at what existed, what remains in Kendall Frost Marsh being very, very valuable and how that would change if we, how, how the, a new marsh would start accumulating uh, carbon if it was expanded and restored into this rewild area. So I'm from the Northeast, like I said, I thought forests were the cat's meow for any kind of carbon storage. But as it turns out, salt marshes, mangroves, seagrasses, the kinds of coastal habitats that slow down uh, sediment, trap sediment away, um, and are uh, uh, salty are really, really good, fantastic. Some of the best habitats on the planet for sequestering carbon. And we're talking about salt marshes here. We don't have mangroves on this side of the border, but those are very close by in Baja. And seagrasses, eelgrass uh, is a lot of what Mission Bay is as well and some other places. Salt marshes and seagrasses are really good at locking away carbon if they have the space and the acreage in order to, uh, to function. One of the other things that we worked very hard on several years ago was to make sure that the city included the carbon sequestration value of tidal wetlands in its cl climate action plan. And with a bunch of help from our coalition members and, and people within the city that were doing it, one of the real um, legislative hooks that we have to push the city to, to make tidal wetland restoration a reality is that it's a, one of the goals of its climate action plan. And you can see here that, that fairly slim line of teal there is what they know or what their, their research shows uh, tidal wetlands will restore if they reach their goal of 700 acres of restored tidal marsh by 2035. It's not a very big line, uh, obviously. There's a huge, uh, of the other six strategies that are in there take up the rest of that, uh, that space below that line that we need to get to. A lot of that is transportation, a lot of that's the built environment, um, but it is a big enough line that it is one of the strategies and it's one of the strategies that has all, all of those other benefits of water quality improvement and uh, opportunities to reconnect and um, <clears throat> store carbon long term. So it's the only one of the few strategies that the city has that actually locks carbon away rather than just reduce closer to zero. This action from a tidal wetland goes negative. And so it can make up for some of that other um, the emissions that are going to come from even well-managed transportation sector and built environment sector. Tidal wetland has the benefit of going negative and helping the city get even below some of the goals that it has from the other ones. <clears throat> so, but I'll, I'll focus now on birds even more. The, the reason we got involved and one of the other big benefits for some of the groups, certainly our group, certainly I think Buena Vista Audubon Society, is that it is important habitat for all kinds of birds, especially federally endangered Ridgeways rails. So you guys have Ridgeways rails. Do you hear them often in Buena Vista Lagoon? Okay. Yeah. I, I love this. I usually set this up by saying that the rail has such a beautiful call. You guys probably already know that that's, a, that's not true. But this video that was taken on a floating platform that, uh, that I'll talk more about in the next couple of slides is, a, is an awesome uh, introduction to rails for all of the folks around, uh, around us that don't know rails very, very well yet. Um, it's a cool video taken a couple of years ago. Can you hear it? Yeah? Okay. Such a beautiful call, right? Um, I mean, their call is pretty cool. I don't know if we love them only because of their call, 
Um, they also have brought they ne lay nests in, uh, in the tidal wetland habitat, and um, we were lucky enough, or the UCFSD was lucky enough to see the, um, these chicks brought to this nesting platform um, soon after they were hatched. They were hatched in the in the marsh and then brought here at high tide. You can see the tide level in the marsh is right at the bottom of this platform, and at this point, it's the only dry land in the marsh. If they're not here, then they're going on to the edge of the marsh where humans and our noise and our cats and our predators and, and our water pollution and light pollution are. So this is a really important habitat for them if they uh, are nesting and have chicks in the marsh. <clears throat> they're not, they don't also win Parent of the Year awards, I'd say, but later on they grab one of them uh, chicks and just yank it back onto the, <laughs> the platform. Uh, showing that they do really care about their chicks and, and eventually start wondering where they are. Uh, but really, really cute uh, uh, Ridgeway rail chicks in these videos and in this marsh, this one little location uh, where there was a platform. And so there, it's about to grab. There, see, it's, it's worried about, <laughs> about uh, its chick and it rescues it to safety here. So. The uh, we have a cup. We have a program now in in the Mars. That video was from 2018, 2019. In the past couple of years, we've gotten some grants uh, from the same uh, foundation that Buena Vista is using for its uh, planning of the lagoon restoration. Part of the way that we've used those funds is to start a wildlife camera project. Um, we put them on some of these nests, just like I was mentioning there, and you can see a still photo in the upper right. I've got some really good. Uh, videos that were taken uh, from some of the other cameras here. The cool thing about this, or the neat thing about this, aside from a little glimpse into rail habitat and actions that we wouldn't see otherwise, is that you can also see that the tide is super, super high here. These platforms are on dry ground for most of the time. Uh, so when the tide comes in, and especially during really high tides, they lift up and um, have just water underneath them. They're, they're feet above the high tide line when um, when it is high tide. Uh, and this one is also taken from another camera there. And you can see this, this rail comes up from the bottom of the platform for some reason, but super, super cute. And I don't know if you, has anybody ever seen a rail anywhere? I mean, anywhere, I guess, but in the Buena Vista Lagoon, do you ever see them? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. For, uh, for Kendall Frost Marsh, we never see them except in these cameras, or we do some uh, surveys where we'll kayak around at high tide and look inside the platforms. They're really, really hard to see. Researchers have said they, they compared to, I've seen a few of them at the Tijuana Estuary where they just walk right across the platform, you know, across the walkway. It's like they're not even endangered at all. But in Kendall Frost Marsh, especially, they're very hard to see. Um, and so it's really awesome to get these wildlife cameras giving us a glimpse of, of what they're doing out there. We've had, uh, several cameras of, they, they kind of shut down and lose battery. They're, they're solar powered, but they're on blink on and off again. But we have about nine of them out there that are on nine different platforms. And so we get a lot of very cute pictures, a lot of really cool videos, uh, from this program. And we're using it as one of the ways that we're sharing what's going on in the marsh with the public in ways that they wouldn't see otherwise, we wouldn't see otherwise. Um, <clears throat> we also have used it as a, as a, uh, we've got, gotten some help from some after school programs uh, to recreate or to, to restore these platforms. They go out in the marsh when the students are done with them, if they, if they function. Um, so these three groups here on the top, on the left-hand side and the top, were battling each other on how to put, uh, um, uh, palm fronds on these, um, nesting platforms to, to make them good habitat for uh, Ridgeways rails when they would go out in the marsh. And then on the bottom right here is one that needs a little bit of restoration for sure, but it shows you what they look like out in the marsh at high tide again. So when tides lower, that one will just drop down a foot there and be right on pickleweed and, and some cord grass for most of the day and for most of, most of the um, season. One of the things we did was build a coalition of groups that were that all talked to the city and, and talked with the public about why wetland restoration was was important. 
So hopefully uh, a bunch of these groups look familiar and are uh, very familiar to you, like the Buena Vista Audubon Society. Uh, but also we tried to get as diverse a coalition as we could. There's a couple of labor unions in here. There's a couple of religious organizations. There's uh, groups that focus on education. There's groups that focus on uh, Native American reconnection opportunities. So we tried to get all kinds of groups. We would almost take anybody we could for sure, but we tried to specifically go out and target groups that could make an argument about human health, like the San Diego Pediatricians for Clean Air, that could make an argument about uh, that it being the right thing to do from a faith perspective, or that being it being a good uh, opportunity for the city and the, the community of PB, like some of the businesses that are on here, bike rental businesses and kayak rental places, uh, um, uh, nature uh, nature guides, those kinds of things, some fishing a fishing group, so we tried to get as broad-based coalition as we could because then the city leaders and the parks department told us more about who would benefit from this tidal wetland recreation uh, restoration vision. So now we'll get down into a little bit of the nitty gritty here to give you kind of the, the update as of, um, as of the summer. On the left-hand side at the top here is the city's plan for the northeast corner of the bay. They released several versions of this starting in about 20, in 2022, they released a uh, notice of preparation. They had released one in 2018, but in 2022, they released a new one, which was way better than the 2018 one. And then since 2022, the plan has changed a little bit, but not too much um, in 2023. And then as of what they voted on in 2024, this ver uh, version here on the left-hand side is from April, 2024 and reflects what it is that the city council was looking at when they voted in May of 2024, for, so just a couple of months ago. And then it's compared to the one on the right, which is that version of tidal wetland restoration that I showed earlier. That's what we were going for, the wildest wetland restoration. And on the bottom here, the city, uh, at the very bottom of the chart is the wildest plan. So that's, for, for our, from our perspective and from the coalition's perspective, that's what we're comparing the city to. That's that's how much habitat we know will fit in this area. Um, that. And, and not this whole area. The black is the is the study area outline, and a lot of the park is still left as you know as public park, normal public park for whatever it is that the city wants to do there. But we know that this wildest acreage will fit there. We know that uh, it needs a lot of support habitat around it that wouldn't be wetland at, at front uh, at when it's first in, uh, created. And we also know what how much habitat will be there as sea levels rise in 2100. So that's what's on the bottom of the chart. And then above those, the De Anza Natural and the three ones below that are the four plans that went through the city's EIR, the city's um, CEQA review. We helped get the city funding for this. Again, it was compared to what they had created first in 2018. We got the city council to tell the planning department, we want a better wetland restoration version, uh, one with more wetland restoration than what you've proposed. And so the city came up with these four plans Long story short, the wetlands optimized sounds good. It is good. It was the best one of what the city came up with. Um, it went all the way through the CEQA planning process. And so it was uh, analyzed for how much habitat acreage would, would exist in 2100 there. And sea level rise was one of the main things we were emphasizing the plan needed to, to be thinking about. <clears throat> uh, but the De Anza Natural Plan was the city's preferred alternative. Um, and compared to the wildest one, it's about 83% of the acres that we were going for from wildest. And it is the one that the city passed. City, city Council voted unanimously to approve the De Anza Natural Land Use Plan, the one that on the left there, um, in May, for, May 14th of 2024, so just at the beginning of the summer. So we got 83%, we, you know, there's lots of other kinds of things around the edges, but our main goal was to go big for wetland restoration, and the city agreed 83% of the way. So their plan had 83% of the acres that we showed were possible. And 83% is pretty good. Not great, but pretty good. Um, and it's really awesome and momentous that the city approved the plan unanimously too. That's um, a good momentum to keep it going. Now we are still trying to improve the plan as it goes to Coastal Commission in some specific ways, uh, but we also wanna work with the city to get this done finish the planning that's required, and then let's start putting uh, tidal wetland habitat in place uh, in the northeast corner of the bay. So I also wanted, um, it's it's 8.40, so I'll, I'll wrap up here in the next five minutes or so, but I just wanted to share, if 
if this is of interest, that this was our, our last coalition letter about the version that the city was, was looking at in, in the, their May meeting. We were asking for these five specific changes to be made. And of these five, they agreed, they did these two. So half of one, and they did number three, and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 were ones that they had already done and improved the plan before even this May meeting. So these are the pieces of what we asked for that we actually got, the kind of nitty gritty that we were asking the city, advocating for the city to improve on their De Anza natural plan. And they did these ones that we also were asking for a dedicated funding from, from the city to make the plan a reality. They talked about that in person during the meeting with several of the council members saying, hey, we've got money in this feasibility, in this um, Mission Bay Park Improvement Fund. It should be plan uh, used for this. It can be used, right? And the city staff said, yes, it could be used. It should be used. So that was kind of addressed in person during the meeting, but wasn't uh, the plan didn't change with that, which it shouldn't have. This is about funding for it. So these are the ones, these are the proportion of what we were asking for that we got we the rewild coalition the other ones we're still um still you know annoyed about <laughs> we still think that these uh, other three or four things on here should, would make the plan better for water quality improvement for human reconnection for endangered species habitat uh, but we didn't haven't gotten the city to do it so far but these other pieces are the crux of what we want to talk to the coastal commission about when they are looking at this plan, the city has to next go to the Coastal Commission. And I think some of the, there's a lot of good language in this city plan about coastal resilience, shoreline resilience and natural shorelines. A lot of these other pieces talk about that shoreline component, but there, there's very few guarantees about what the city will do along that shoreline. So we're very nervous that the city is saying some nice things in this plan, but not, need, not gonna be forced to act on them. So that's, I think, what our main focus when we go to talk with the Coastal Commission is to put some of those things that are already in this plan in more concrete and more, you know, will instead of could language. Um, so as, as the Rewild Project goes along, we want to improve the plan so that San Diego can talk about climate resiliency from a position of power in, in, the, in the country. Um, the Climate Action Plan is one of the, one of the first, it was one of the first in the countries in the country for uh, dealing with and addressing climate action, what needed to be done at a city level. We also know that uh, our Ridgeways rails, our uh, building Savannah Sparrows, our California lease turns that eat fish that are produced from tidal wetland habitat, and a lot of the other more even more common species are need this kind of habitat and have been kicked out of this kind of habitat for decades and decades. The opportunity to restore habitat for Ridgeways rails and other migratory and resident species would be fantastic and would make a would make a big difference. Um, would make a, make it so that Ridgeways Rails had a large enough, a big enough space and enough acres here to actually have a population that survived, a, a resilient population. And then from our point of view, the wetlands management and implementation plan is the next step that the city should be taking. And we want to help get funding for that so that we have some power over it and so that it gets done quickly. Um, all of this is for us is in a context of climate change. Certainly we talked about sea level rise a lot. We talked about endangered species. It's only going to get harder for a lot of these endangered species. On the left-hand side from a few years ago is the uh, research from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and several others talking about how many birds uh, we have lost since 1970. So we are 3 billion birds poorer in, the, in North America since 1970, and that's without even much of a signal of climate change. That's just from habitat loss and pollution and endangered or and uh, non-native species, invasive species, and all of those kinds of things. And then on the right-hand side is Audubon research about what how species ranges will change as uh, temperatures increase. And two-thirds of our species in North America, their range will decrease. They will get closer to extinction as temperatures rise. So we need to be talking about habitat restoration. With all of these other benefits, it really is going to be beneficial and necessary to help give these species that space, physical space for them to have resilient populations. Um, and the, for me, the Rewild Mission Bay project is, uh, is a positive project. We're talking, you know, a lot of people don't want to see it, but way more people want to see it happen. Way more people are uh, uh, want to talk about water quality improvement, want to talk about habitat restoration from a positive, uh, active role that we can take to deal with some of these issues head on and get some of these benefits head on. 
So the last thing I wanted to say, I've got one more minute, maybe until 9.45 uh, or 8.45. The other thing that's happening in Mission Bay, this is all just happening this summer, but just in case it's made it up your way in terms of news or whatever, this year, 16,000 terns nested on a on West Ski Island in Mission Bay. If you know Mission Bay, West Ski Island is not a tern preserve. There are four California least tern nesting sites in Mission Bay that are fairly well protected. But there's another island called West Ski Island, and it was used in the thousands by elegant terns this year. There were 7,600, uh, more than 7,600 nests, uh, elegant tern nests on West Ski Island this year. So a huge site. There had been a couple of hundred and a couple of thousand in past years, just in the last five years. But this year, it really blew up uh, and was an awesomely important site for elegant terns. And it was so loud and awesome and beautiful to see um, all summer long um, that we we then saw after the 4th of July fireworks and learned about this Thunderbolt race that just happened uh, last weekend, that there were some recreational focused impacts that were happening in the Bay that were not responding to this new value of West Ski Island, the new importance that ele uh, elegant turns were uh, uh, giving to this West Ski Island. So we started talking with the city and talking with the Coastal Commission and, and re regulatory agencies about these four things that we wanted to see done in Mission Bay to better protect West Ski Island and make it so that elegant turns had a productive year and would come back. Um, long story short, uh, we had seen some of these elegant terns die and wash up on shore after July. We saw these ones on the shore July 6th after two big fireworks shows in Mission Bay. There often is one big fireworks show, but this year there were two. Um, and the terns responded by, by flying up at night, flying around for hours, and also some of them drowning and getting kicked off the island. So this is what started some of our advocacy. We mapped the places that we saw their bodies wash ashore in Kendall Frost Marsh. So this is this is the rewild area of Mission Bay. And uh, we're talking with SeaWorld and we're talking with community groups about fireworks impacts and, and the boating impacts um, in Mission Bay. And long story short, uh, that's the last slide I have, the Mission Bay Park Committee just last month voted to greatly diminish or eliminate fireworks in Mission Bay. They, they don't have the authority to end it, but they will tell the mayor and our politicians that they don't see the need for one fireworks show a night, which is what SeaWorld is allowed to do, and these two big shows. So they acted on fireworks. The Coastal Commission got in touch with the Bayfair folks, and the Bayfair had been working on a coastal development permit that was from the year 2000. And every year they got a waiver, one year after another, <clears throat> from that coastal development permit from 20, almost 25 years ago. So the co we brought this issue up. We said there's nothing that the Bayfair organizers are doing to protect this area. Uh, it's got much, it's got a lot of environmental importance and it's got new environmental importance. And the Coastal Commission agreed. They've told the Bayfair that they have to collect a bunch of biological information this year and they will use it to improve, to improve and change the coastal development permit that the Bayfair could get next year. So that is, uh, it's very bureaucratic, but a very interesting kind of uh, change, hopefully, as long as we keep pushing, change to the um, active recreation going on in Mission Bay, especially around that West Key Island um, elegant turn nesting site. So I just wanted to throw that in there too. Hopefully you'd heard about some of that. Hopefully you've seen it. Um, it was really awesome all summer long and hopefully they'll come back next year too. But that is physically close and a lot of the same kind of advocacy partners that we worked with on this um, issue, as well as the Rewild Mission Bay issue. So, Joni, that's it. Great. Wow. You're doing a lot of really good work. Um, what what kind of timeline are you expecting, you know, in terms of the progress? For the Rewild Mission Bay project? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, co the city of San Diego has told us that they expect to give their um, their De Anza Natural, is their, their plan that they approved, give that to the Coastal Commission and start getting it on the agenda and start talking with the Coastal Commission about it this fall. So that's pretty quick. They, they voted on it in May, and the planning department is working to get it to the Coastal Commission this fall. No guarantees that, that, that it will happen, but we are pushing them. as uh, uh, we, you know, we took a couple of weeks off in May and June to say, okay, got some rewild action done, but we have been pushing them and asking them and they still tell us that they expect it will be at, given to the Coastal Commission this fall. And then it will probably take a year 
uh, back and forth for the Coastal Commission to approve it, um, you know, hopefully, then the city can start acting on that land use plan. But the city, our partners at the city have told us that even before the Coastal Commission approves the plan, we can start working with them uh, and helping them get funding to do a lot of the planning that's not going to not going to change whether the Coastal Commission changes the land use plan or not. There's going to be a lot of kind of underlying research and under underlying data gathering that can go into a wetlands management plan that will then respond to the Coastal Commission's approved version of the plan. So we expect to and hope to start work looking for grants and getting this uh, through the Coastal Commission in the next um, year. Wow, that's great. We have a couple comments in the chat about the rails. Those were just such cool videos. I'm really glad we got the sound going too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But one of the a really good place to see the rails up close is San Alijo Lagoon, and they have a really beautiful boardwalk um, that you can actually get quite close and even see the baby chicks. Um, and uh, it's pretty cool because they're they're used to people being on the boardwalks, and they they come pretty close. Um, and then Patty says she's also seen them on the platform at Kendall Frost. You have Patty? Amazing. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. Well, with the with the top on it. Yeah, we had. Um, it was numerous people were out there looking for uh, Nelson's sparrow, and um, we we're not having success with that. So we we're looking at other things, and you could see the the rails on the on the little platforms there. It was really awesome. cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I do have a couple of, Joni, do you mind if I ask a couple of questions? Go ahead. Thank you. So I do have a question. So, and I could look this up, but the rails, when they nest, when they have their eggs, do they also have, do they build a floating platform? Do you know? Or how do they deal with the, the tide with their nests? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So the, I, you know, I haven't seen rails nest in Kendall Frost Marsh, but we have walked around with Dick Zembel in uh, J Street Marsh and a couple of other places, and they will build a form or they'll build a nest that is like woven together cord grass. Cord grass is the plant they need in order to make a good one. And the more they weave it around, the more kind of it falls down. It looks a little bit like a platform, but but a lot more natural. Um, and that that nest can can rise some inches and up to a feet as sea levels or as the tides rise. So they pick a spot that will not get swamped, but they do pick a spot that goes up and down as um, the tide comes in and out. Okay. The, and in Kendall Frost Marsh, there's not very much cord grass left. So even beyond high tides and, and king tides, there also is not enough cord grass for them to nest in as best as they would otherwise. Okay. So that might be something that we should look into for our planting for the the lagoon restoration. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Kendall Frost Marsh. Those we we had cameras out this year, like I was saying, and there are there were we know that there are some nests that were out there that were not on the platforms. Only one of those platforms had an active nest. But a lot, we saw other chicks and other adults come onto those platforms. So they were nesting out in the marsh like they, you know, would naturally do. But as everything that I've read and the managers that I've talked to say that cord grass is a really important component of whether the nest will be um, uh, successful or not. It's got to be thick enough so that they're not predated on from the top and thick enough so that they don't get swamped and, uh, by high tides. Great. And then the other thing that I just wanted to mention was that um, our conservation committee um, wrote a letter unanimously approved by the board and we sent it to the California Coastal Commission in support of um, measures to protect the West Key Island turns. Yeah. <laughs> um, Margo, you had a question if you want to unmute yourself. Yes, I have um, like vague information, not very good, but the information that um, I have is that there's uh, development, uh, probably the campgrounds or some building, and uh, the landscaping includes tall palm trees on which uh, raptors can perch and pick off the, um, you know, the terns and other species. And uh, what I've heard is that there was like um, some kind of conservation um, you know, letter or agreement a long time ago, maybe 20 or 30 years, 
that um, is being violated by these uh, uh, tall landscaping trees where the raptors can perch. Do you have any information about that? You, you, you're talking about down in, in Mission Bay at the, at yeah. the edge where we're looking at? Yeah. Um, Margaret, I don't know what that document or agreement might be. Uh, biologically, you're, you're totally correct. There's all kinds of perches around Mission Bay for things that, that prey on California least terns, especially those, that, those ones we monitor and know that peregrine falcons and red tail hawks and uh, owls will pick up the chicks or pick up the eggs and, and pretty on them. And we know that there's lots more perches in Mission Bay than there would naturally be. Coastal sage scrub doesn't have palm trees in it. It doesn't have buildings. It doesn't have um, it doesn't have all of the ornamental trees that are around Mission Bay. Um, so that's totally true. And, and totally there's a lot more crows around as well, because crows do a good job of nesting in palm trees. And so we get crow predation on the eggs. If they if crows or ravens find out that the terns are nesting, uh, they will then decimate a whole population. It, it doesn't happen too often in Mission Bay, but I've heard that it happens up and down the coast at other least turn sites. So it's definitely a problem is providing artificial uh, uh, perching and nesting sites for predators. Um, I know that in the in Mission Bay, in the short term plan that the Coastal Commission approved for removing the mobile homes in the northeast corner of the bay, this was a couple of years ago. All of those um, mobile homes that were on De Anza Peninsula had to be removed, and in that. CDP coastal development permit for that specific action that was taken, the um, the coastal commission re required them to put native plants in 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 place uh, to replace any vegetation that they removed. So that I hope and we'll continue advocating that that is what the standard should be is that ornamental planting should be with natives, not non natives. Um, so that's that's the direction we're certainly hoping to go, um, and in the campgrounds now that will become wetland in the future, there'll be a lot less perches because a lot of those existing trees will change into tidal wetland habitat. But if you know which document you mean, you, you uh, or if you find out any more detail about it, let me know. Okay. Yeah, thanks. And uh, Joan Bachman, you had a question. You wanna unmute yourself? This is Joan, not Kevin in the picture. Um, I'm not on my computer, so I'm not going to try to mess with it too much. Um, so a, a question and a comment, which hopefully makes my comment not uh, valid. Um, my question is, is camp land going to be completely gone? Uh, because my husband and I had a chance to completely walk through there, and it was horrific. There was no camping. It was people driving their homes in and opening out and a bunch of... Um, mechanized uh, things driving all over the place and lots of plastic and lots of people basically bringing their entire home with them um, to camp land. So we did not see it as camping at all. Um, and hopefully it will be completely gone because we saw absolutely nothing that benefited the Bay there. And as anybody who knows me knows, I am thrilled to hear you say there should be no palm trees. Um, I believe there should be no palm trees west of and a Borrego, but you know, um, <laughs> that, that's. Yeah. Kevin, uh, sorry. I, 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 mean, I agree with, with what you said for sure. Um, you know, Camp Land is a, as is a company, it leases public space. A lot of people love the company. Uh, a lot of people don't like the company. We've tried our hardest to not argue with the company itself. The company, you know, gets people to come out and yell at us. And we're always talking with the city about the best use of city property. Not a, not, it's not a disagreement with them or, or how they're running their business or whatever it is. We're, we're not, we don't need to have that argument because it's, it's a public park argument. But it's not my idea of camping personally. Um, but they are very well connected. They have a lot of power. They've been there for a while. Uh, but as you can see on the approved land use plan, when this happens, and for sure Camp Land would like it to never happen, they'd like it to just go on the shelf and, and not change anything, the Camp Land, the area that's currently leased by Camp Land drastically changes into 
some upland um, island and, and transition habitat and tidal wetland habitat. The company that runs this area also now runs um, the um, the Mission Bay RV Park, which is what which was on Mission uh, De Anza Peninsula here. So they basically they're moving to the other side of the bay, and this pink area is what becomes low cost guest accommodation that kind of land um, that kind of land use. Certainly, one of the things that we're advocating for. Or as we get to this part of the plan is that low cost guest accommodation should include a lot more tent camping, should include a lot more uh, publicly accessible low cost sites that are actually inviting and accessible to people from th throughout the county. But again, we're, you know, we're not arguing with the owner about how to run a campground. We're, we're talking with the city about the best use of public space. So um, we'll keep trying to make sure that it is accessible to the public and actually low cost. And I think those are our uh, main goals with however the camping turns out. Uh, another question, is there still a boardwalk in the approved plan? The, well, a boardwalk, the, the plan includes, the plan states that all of the public shoreline here will have public access and will have a bike path around it. So I'm not sure if it says whether it'll be a boardwalk or whether it will be concrete or anything like that. But this dotted line here is the connection to the rest of the the sand the uh, Mission Bay uh, public trail, the biking trail that goes around it. The city plan that's approved has it going right along the edge of the shoreline there to up up Rose Creek into the trolley stop and then across the Mike Gotch Bridge. So there will be a lot of shoreline access through that public path. And everything outside, everything shoreward of that public path will be publicly accessible. Um, they haven't de decided, they, they punted, they avoided describing how to cross this channel, whether that's going to be a boardwalk or a giant bridge abutment or that can carry an RV or whether it's something you could just walk across or bike across. That's not clear. It's not stated one way or the other in this in the what the city planned. So it has to be argued about and figured out in the next mo more detailed version of what the city um, will design. Okay. <clears throat> um, I don't have any other questions in the chat. Anybody else have questions for Andrew? No, going, going. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much. Nice to meet you all. Uh, and thanks again for uh, for the good questions, for, for the attention, and for the support. Thank you, Patty, for the uh, West Gallon support. Thank you to the, all the Buena Vista Society, uh, Audubon Society, for being in our coalition and uh, yelling with us at the city of San Diego to get as good a plan as we could get. Great. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah. Have a good evening. Thanks very all much, right. Joni. Thanks, thanks everybody. Bye, Patty. Bye.